Is your business protected against the threat of malicious litigation and frivolous lawsuits? Are you sinking company profits into marketing campaigns that do nothing to contribute to the growth of your business? Bottled Business Sense provides practical business perspectives that uniquely emphasize both legal and media marketing strategies to protect and ensure the longevity of your business. Now, whether you're trying to provide a startup business with some level of stability or an established business with foolproof asset and state protection, or simply attempting to get a better return for your business marketing dollars, Bill Bernard and Rick Muscoso will expose potential pitfalls to ensure the security and growth of your business, free from unwanted expense and the threat of litigation. You'll learn how to implement marketing and protection tools equal to those used by today's most successful corporations. Let's join Bill and Rick for today's Bottled Business Sense Show. Good morning, everyone. This is Rick Moscoso with the Bottle Business Sense Show. I am one of your co-hosts here this morning, along with Bill Bernard. Uh, we are a uh, simulcast show for our small business owners out there uh, to offer free tips, advice, and best practices from uh, legal topics to marketing topics that can help the small business owner run more efficiently, more effectively, and, and uh, most of all, more profitably. And so uh, we hope you enjoy uh, the topics that we've done in the past for you. Uh, if you're a first-time listener or viewer, uh, go to bottledbusinesssenseshow.com and you can look up our, uh, ex- uh, our lengthy library of topics that we've done over the last two years um, in regards to any specific topic, business, marketing, or legal related to your business, uh, you feel free to, to go ahead and click on any of those replays. I think you, you'll find these of uh, big value to, uh, to you and, and your practice. So um, we're also on social media. You can reach out to us uh, at the Bottled Business, sorry, Bottled Business Sense Show at gmail.com if you uh, would like to hear a, a specific topic or even want to be a guest on the show. You can also reach us on social media Facebook, Google, uh, Twitter, um, at uh, the same handle. So you can. Uh, reach out to us in any of those uh, any of those means. Our contact information is also below the video. So uh, if you have a need to reach out to myself or to Bill, feel free to do so, and we'll get back to you right away. So with that, uh, here we are Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. at our regular scheduled time, and I uh, want to welcome Mr. Bill Bernard to the uh, uh, to the show and see how you're doing today, Bill. I'm doing great, Rick. Thanks. I uh, welcome everybody to the show. I, I, uh, I, I really, uh, really going to try to condense a lot of material today into this show. And the show is uh, really, really important for our employers out there. It's called uh, uh, Critical Guidelines, uh, Critical HR Guidelines, HR being Human Resources. Uh, for California employers, critical HR guidelines for California employers, and and the reason I I chose this topic today, Rick, is 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 very simple. I had a couple of recent experiences where I have some smaller clients that do not have HR departments, and they so they contract out with different HR agencies to do this on a part time basis as an HR problem arises. I don't always necessarily agree with that, but you know, whatever your budget may be, you may need to do that as opposed to employing a full-time HR person. But but regardless, some clients ask me, uh, hey, we, we, we don't mind paying you for HR stuff uh, because you're a lawyer, you can prevent things before they happen. And of course, I'm, to, I'm in total agreement with that. But what I can't do is do an actual HR investigation. I can tell a client what I think about a certain HR issue. But if you need to have an HR person do an investigation because an employee complains about something, you got to have an objective third party do that, i.e., an HR person. Because if the attorney does the investigation, that attorney, if there's litigation that ensues, can there can thereafter be deposed, not as the attorney representing the client, but as the investigator, just like an HR person would be able to be deposed if you had them full time working at your place of employment. Uh, the the person bringing the lawsuit could ask to have the HR uh, be deposed, the HR individual. So what I thought I'd do is provide the employers today with some really important HR guidelines that they need to know about. And then hopefully when they go to their attorney and ask questions 
or when they have their HR person actually implement these policies, the HR person will know what they're talking about. Uh, and the employer will know what uh, what uh, better have a better understanding of these things when he or she speaks to a lawyer, should they need to do so about whatever issue it may be. So I've 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 really done this in three sections. The first section is going to be employment practices. What you need to know about HR employment practices. The second will be what you need to know about standards of conduct in the workplace. And the third is going to be what you need to know about benefits, employee benefits. So employment practices in general, which is basically a lot of paperwork, two standards of conduct, and number three, benefits for employees. <clears throat> so let's tackle the first issue, uh, employment practices. This, this really has to do, Rick, with um, comprising, as I said, paperwork guidelines. What you should do before you hire somebody is to make sure you have an offer letter in the file, some, some sort of a letter that presents the offer in writing. Make sure you have W-4 forms. Make sure you have uh, I-9 forms. These are tax forms that you're better uh, left to speaking to your accountant about. And make sure you have new hire reporting forms. All of these forms and this introductory uh, letter they all should be signed by the employee. They all should be put in the employee's file uh, that you begin. All of these things are done prior to and at the time on the first day of employment. So other things would include state disability insurance notices, uh, information on workers' comp insurance, uh, sexual harassment policies, what paid family leave policies are, if you have any. So policies that you implement in your company, like paid family leave, sexual harassment policies, workers' compensation policies, state disability policies, and then all of the, uh, the tax information and offer letter should be done at first blush when the employee is offered a position and then on the first day when you sit down with that employee, when you spend an hour or two with them before he or she actually goes on the job. These are important employee uh, practices that basically comprise a lot of paperwork, but should be done at the outside to avoid, at the outset, I'm sorry, to avoid any miscommunication or ambiguity. Because it starts, all starts on the first day. Actually yeah. starts before the first day when you, when you provide the offer letter. But but you really got to make sure you're on top of this stuff. And I think a lot of people fail to do this uh, because who likes paperwork, right? You got to have an HR person who's able to sit down and do this. And if you don't, and you're the HR person too, then you need to make time for it. So for a, a small business that does not have uh, an HR department to their disposal, is this something that they would request from an attorney, an employment uh, law attorney or, or outsource to a, an HR, you know, a third party outfit uh, where, where would they well, where, HR, where would they get this stuff you'd have to you'd have to find the hr person on the job market either through an agency or the newspaper or wherever you may find that person just like you would any other person you're looking for if you contract out with an hr person again there'd be some advertisement uh, about that or there are large companies like payroll companies that have HR people employed that specialize in HR and that work as part of the payroll company. So you can only use them on a contractual basis as you need them. Uh, again, I, I would urge employers to, if they can afford it, to have an HR person full time on the premises. It's really important. Uh, and I think just as important, Rick, is the second part of this uh, um paperwork uh, scenario, and that is employee file maintenance. I really want to emphasize this. You, here's what you need. And again, this all starts on the first day. You have a personnel file. We've talked about that on other shows, so I'm not going to go into that on detail. in detail. You have number two, a medical benefits file. This has to do with all of the privacy and medical issues that might come up with the employee as, as that person moves forward in the job. You have a payroll file that has the check stubs and all of the tax information. You have uh, other miscellaneous files, which would include your workers' compensation file uh, and any insurance issues. So you have these things separated out 
So when you need to go to one, you know exactly where to find the material. And you have to make sure that that medical file is separate because that could involve a lot of privacy issues that can't be turned over to anybody else without the employee's uh, strict permission. You have to make sure the employee knows that he or she has a right to inspect the personnel file. That was a subject of another show. So I'm not going to go into all of those specifics here, but make sure that employee knows they have the right to inspect the file. And then biggie, a biggie, Rick, employee classification. Are they going to be exempt? Okay. Or are they going to be non-exempt? And I have comprised a test uh, that I've done for employers that they can take as to any specific employee so they will know right off the bat whether they're going to classify that employee as exempt uh, or non-exempt, meaning is one are they on salary or on they are are they on an hourly wage? Because the two have some very important differences. And if you misclassify an employee, you could get heavily fined down the road by uh, pursuant to California labor laws. Yeah. So and you want to make about, and we've talked about this on a previous yeah, episode. We have. So if, and if you want more specifics on it, just take take a look at the bottle business and show uh, dot com website and pull up uh, employment classifications and you'll see a full episode on what Bill's talking about. And 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 make sure that you um Call me or contact me if you need to take have this test done. I'm I'm happy to uh, uh, to prepare it for you, individualize it for your company, and to provide it to you. Um, and of course, you can engage me for that purpose. Make sure employees know what their work schedules are. Rick, gosh knows this creates so much ambiguity uh, down the road if you don't know what your work schedules are. Make sure your employees know how to keep their time. They should have documents that that justify what their time is, how they're spending their time. Certainly, it's critical if you're an hourly employee, but you should have that going on uh, even if you're a salaried employee. So, so you know how that employee is accounting for their time, how you can evaluate that employee to make sure that the time is being accounted for accurately. And of course, that ends up going into part of the process of the annual employee review that you have at the end of the year. So all of this stuff involves what? Two things, discussion with the employee from day one, moving forward, and document documentation. That's why we call it employee employment practices, because it's an employment practice by the employer that involves paperwork and communication with the employee. Um, and finally, in this area, make sure that the uh, that you are familiar with how you're supposed to deduct wages. Make sure you understand how to deal with business expenses and make sure you know how to deal with overtime pay. Because again, if you don't know overtime pay or wage wage information, if you don't know what rest breaks the employees are, are, are due, if you don't know what meal breaks they're due, if you don't know how to advise them on how to report and fill out a worker's compensation form, uh, you're going to be behind the eight ball. So all of this practices, all of these practices involve a strict adherence by an employer who's got her, his or her act together from day one. At the time they write that offer letter, they should have all of this stuff ready to go. The employee comes in, sits down, you give it to them, you put it in the appropriate files that we just spoke of earlier. And then as you move through the process, you make sure you have a line of communication open uh, open with the employee. Yeah, I hope I hope uh, the viewers out there, mm -hmm. listeners out there, aren't in a situation where this is all new to you. <laughs> because yes. while there's a lot of information that Bill's sharing, uh, it's all necessary information that you do need you know, for your business to run it officially and, 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 and legally, right? Right. And this show is really meant to be a bullet point show. Sit down, write these things down <clears throat> so you know what they are. You know what you have to be aware of. Now, you may have to go talk to an attorney and an HR person. You may want to go online and Google some of this stuff. But my point here today is to make you aware of what you need to know, not to give you all of the information under each of those categories, because we'd be here, you know, for several hours doing that. So that's really the importance of this show, awareness, make an employer aware of these things 
uh, from uh, from this point going forward. The second major area that I want to make employers aware of is standards of conduct. For example, harassment. Uh, harassment laws in California mandate, for example, that sexual harassment training must be given to all supervisors at least at least two hours of training every two years if you have 50 or more employees. Now, I would say make sure whether you have 50 or more employees, even though you're not required to by law, train your supervisors, for God's sake. What could it hurt? I mean, make sure you have uh, medical requests uh, down pat. In other words, uh, certain laws prohibit employers from asking or obtaining genetic information about people. Well, how long is your uh, did your dad uh, have cancer? Did he die of cancer? Uh, you know, did you uh, did you work in a coal mine and develop some lung disease years ago uh, that would prevent you from uh, from from working at this job? Well, I mean, uh, some of this these examples sound crazy, but don't be hung up on uh, on that stuff. Know what you can ask and what you can't. Likewise, off-duty conduct. Are, are you going to make sure your employees are aware what off-duty conduct may be prohibited? For example, if you have outside employment uh, activities, uh, they should not be considered an excuse for poor job performance. Well, I'm working two jobs, so I have poor job performance on this job. I'm absent. I'm tardy. I'm leaving early. I don't want to work overtime. That stuff needs to be set forth at the very outset. So uh, this conduct is controlled by the employer with the acknowledgement of the employee. Now, a lot of this stuff is then comprised into an employee handbook, right? We also did a prior show on what should be in an employee handbook. Mm -hmm. But how are you going to put stuff in an employee handbook if your employer is not aware of what goes in there to begin with, right? <laughs> Drug and alcohol abuse. That's another one, Rick. Uh, you need to make clear... Uh, what drug and alcohol abuse is going to be prohibited, how it's going to be prohibited. It's drug, drug testing and stuff. We did another show on that. That would require notice and equal, uh, an equal uh, adaptation to all employees, not singling out one or one employee over the other. Uh, if you're going to test them initially, if you're going to test them on the job periodically, they need to know that that's going to be coming down the pike. Uh, punctuality and attendance. Uh, how critical is that on the job? Termination. Remember that termination is presumed to be at will in California, but it doesn't mean you can't have progressive termination, uh, pr progressive discipline, meaning that you maybe give a written uh, warning, then you give a, uh, a, excuse me, a verbal warning, then you give a written warning, then you terminate. Or it may be such an egregious act that you terminate right on the spot for one, one in one fell swoop. You need to be able to be aware of these things as an HR person. If you're an employer, you need to be aware of these things in conjunction with your HR person, or if as an employer, you're also acting as an HR person yourself. Uh, so you need, you need to be aware of notices that you got to give your employees, right? Uh, health insurance premium notices, uh, what insurance rights they may have pursuant to any medical plan. These are all things that control uh, employee conduct down the road. They need to be made aware of this stuff. It's really critical. These are all HR issues that need to be dealt with at the forefront moving forward from the time the business is implemented uh, until the time it closes if, if it does. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I have a quick question for you because I know in some of the smaller businesses out there, there's usually an area in a <laughs> visible area where you see certificates or or um, notices that that are that are Post, uh, posted on the wall, uh, right? Posted on the wall. What yep. what type of forms are required? Uh, you got, in that's that's required in California. It has this. Uh, it has all of the sexual harassment laws. It has all of the discrimination laws, all of the uh, wage uh, information. And if you're a business, you need to order that. You can get it online, or you can get it uh, for several different places. But you need to order that every year and post it in a visible place in your place of employment, so employees can see that. And that that follows what you need to implement as an employer on the job. So, and that's some of the stuff we just talked about a few minutes ago. Hmm. So the third area, Rick, I wanted to go into briefly is employee benefits. Do you have a vacation or sick leave policy? 
Excuse me. Well, if so, you better make your employee aware of it, just like you would need to make them aware of a bereavement policy. And here's an interesting aspect of this. There is no requirement to to provide paid bereavement to employees. Most companies, however, provide days off uh, when there's a death of an immediate family member uh, that that occurs. And and usually it's somewhere in the vicinity of three days or so. Um, And and a lot of employers provide uh, days off with pay. Some provide it without pay. But, But a bereavement policy, while not necessarily and not, not required by law, excuse me, is something that needs to be, uh, a, the employee needs to be advised of whether it exists or doesn't exist. And obviously, uh, those things are helpful th- in, in, in providing employee morale, God forbid, if it's ever required, uh, along with other leaves. Do you have pregnancy, pregnancy disability leave? I wonder how many people know that you, you may take up the four months of leave uh, if you're disabled because of a pregnancy uh, and you're able to take four months for each pregnancy. So uh, that's a, that's sometimes a, a burden on employees uh, on employers. Uh, and I say that, that, that figuratively really, because uh, it's something you need to be aware of and you can't use it as an excuse to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, you know, abuse an employee. An employee uh, has to have that job reserved for them when they come back from from pregnancy leave. Uh, if they're unable to return from work after taking four months, and then at the end of four months they cannot be uh, returned to work, then uh, then they are in a uh, strict manner of speaking subject to termination at that point medical leave. I mean, that's a biggie in California now, Rick. Uh, Employers with 50 or more employees must provide employees with 12 weeks of unpaid uh, protected leave during any 12-month period. 12 weeks for every year if you are an employer that has 50 more employees. What do you get this medical leave for? Well, the birth of a child, uh, medical care for an employee's spouse, child, or parent who has a serious health condition, or even a registered domestic partner now. And uh, you may have somebody who uh, qualifies for an impending call to active duty in the armed services. Uh, you may uh, you may be able to establish that you need some time off uh, because of this uh, call to active duty. So these are really critical things you need to know that can all um Call, come into play as a possible claim by employees. If you don't know your HR principles, if you don't know these critical guidelines, you're going to fall beside the. Uh, uh, we're going to fall beside the uh, the the the, uh, the line of defense here, and you're going to be in uh, in bad shape. I might mention that employees are required to provide at least 30 days advance notice before any family leave begins. So they are required to provide some notice. Hey, could you clarify then, um, you know, here in California, we have a couple of uh, uh, military bases and um, uh, for an employer that has somebody who's um, like, let's say in the reserves or something like that, and they get actively deployed, but they're going to be gone longer than that 12 weeks. Um, what, how does, what is the status of his job position um, if he's going to be gone longer than the 12 weeks? Well, typically, if they're going to be, remember, uh you get 12 weeks for family or medical leave if you're called up to active duty, Rick. But uh, that's that's like for a reserve or somebody like that. And a typical uh, typical instance is for a reserve uh, who's going to be coming back to the job. It's not somebody who's going to be gone long for a long period of time. There is military service leave, which we haven't gotten to yet, but I'll mention it now. And that is uh, military leave of absence is not required if it's impossible for precluded or precluded by military necessity. And you must qualify for that. But if you do qualify for that, uh, then you're going to have a a different type of leave. You're going to have a military service leave, uh, which will typically be something different than just the 12 weeks that you have off for a call to active duty over a, a temporary period of time. Those are things that are you should uh, discuss with your employer, with your HR person. That HR person is supposed to be aware of that and is supposed to know how to implement that. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, and and it, it it becomes critical when you have a situation and you uh, somebody needs to leave and you don't know what to tell them. I mean, obviously, then you're 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 all of a sudden uh, in a tizzy trying to figure out what to do. These policies need to be made aware of, uh, need to have the employee be made aware of it by the HR person, uh, and you need to be able to be ready to implement them at a moment's notice. Likewise, you know what we probably want to close the show with is talking a little bit about jury duty or witness duty uh, in voting leave. A California uh, exempt employees or must be paid a full salary for a week's leave of jury duty as long as they are able to come into the job and work a couple of hours. So if you come in on a Friday and you work two hours and you're on duty, jury duty for the rest of the week, uh, or you, or you're able to work it maybe at uh, some with some other arrangement for your with your employer. Uh, you are entitled to a full um, your full week's pay. Non-exempt employees, hourly employees, uh, do not have to be paid wages while they're on jury duty. It's not required. And voting leave, uh, you're allowed to uh, paid leave. You're allowed to, without loss of pay. You're allowed at least two hours of time to be able to go out and vote. Uh, and of course, um, the final one I want to I want to bring up is something that's very interesting uh, that that maybe a lot of employers don't know. But you are entitled if you're an employer with 25 or more employees, you must provide time off for an employee who needs drug or alcohol rehabilitation. Mm-hmm. Um, the leave is unpaid unless the person has accrued sick leave, and then they can use that sick leave until it runs out and be paid for that. Once it runs out, then they go on unpaid leave. Uh, But you must, uh, pursuant to the California Labor Code, allow that to occur if you have 25 or more employees. Now, if you don't have 25 or more employees, do you you run into a problem? Uh, I would say typically not, but you never know what other extraneous factors may be going on there. I, I, that would ha- I would say approach that on a pro hoc basis, meaning a case by case basis and find out uh, uh, from an attorney what your options might be. So to, so to recap, and I know this has been a little bit uh, hectic of a show for some people. I just found it so important that to point these things out, uh, I want to recap very briefly. The HR guidelines that you need to be aware of as an employer, employment practices is number one. That involves all kinds of paperwork guidelines and keeping employee files, notifying employee of work schedules and their right to inspect the files and what their uh, what wages will be taken from their uh, their pay, uh, meal breaks, rest breaks, workers' compensation issues. The second major area for HR is standards of conduct. That's harassment issues, uh, off-duty conduct, drug and alcohol use, punctuality and attendance, termination issues, uh, civil rights issues, meaning discrimination issues. You need to be uh, uh, communicated to the employee, but more importantly, need to be n- need to be known by the employer, or else he can't act. He or she can't act appropriately should these issues come up if raised by an employee. And then the third and final area would be employee benefits. Uh, and we just got done talking about those everywhere from from uh, medical leave to bereavement leave to pregnancy disability to uh, military leave, uh, drug and alcohol testing, all of that good stuff. So uh, those three major areas are typically the areas where HR or human resource problems arise uh, either because an employer doesn't know what to do or because an employee made a claim or because of both. So uh, once you know these things, you're then better able to, uh, to implement these policies by way of creating a employee manual. Again, the employee manual was a subject of another show. And I want to emphasize that this exempt, non-exempt employee issue has become a hot button issue in recent years, because whether you say an employee is exempt or non-exempt really depends on a lot of different things. And I have comprised uh, a test that can be uh, can be utilized by employers if they want to really nail it down. Awesome. 
Well, that's great. Uh, very complex uh, information. Um, the the takeaway from this is sounds like you really need to be organized if you if you Amen. want to you know if you and prepared if you are an employer out there with uh, uh, any sizable business um, and if you do have questions along the line. It, to the topic today of uh, these HR guidelines, please reach out to Bill. His contact information is below. Um, you can also reach out to, to him directly uh, via cell phone. And what's, uh, what's that number, Bill? Uh, 949 area code 413-6535. Business office is 949-698-6222. Uh, and of course, on the website, wfblegalconsulting.com or bill at wfblegalconsulting at gmail.com. Uh, remember, um, that when you, when you think about these things, folks, uh, your business runs as you run. In other words, it's one thing to have, uh, the right attitude and the right business model. Uh, but when you start prospering and that's what we advocate here on this show, as you start to prosper, many times you're going to hire employees and you need to know what you're getting into when you hire employees. You have a, 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 a great responsibility in this state because California law is really adapted to employees. It's really uh, one of the more liberal states that really hones in and takes advantage of providing employees, uh, uh, I don't want to say the benefit of the doubt, but uh, but a lot, of, uh, a lot of leeway for making sure that they're treated fairly. And in order to do that, you need to know these things. You need to know how to have an HR person implement it. Why, Rick? Because an HR person is going to be doing the day-to-day -day stuff, right? You're not, you're going to be running your business. So whether it's an HR person on a contract basis or full-time in your office, you want to have them to be able to be knowledgeable about the subject matter and to be able to pick up the phone and call your attorney if they need some guidance. And by the way, HR people, don't be afraid to do that. The attorney can't investigate the situation. That's what you're there for. But an attorney can give you legal advice on these very sensitive issues that are all hot button issues uh, today in California and elsewhere. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Bill, again, thank you very much for your contribution today. Uh, all very important um, uh, information here in regards to what a small business needs to know about uh, HR guidelines for their business. And again, um, reach out to Bill if you have any questions in regarding these topics. And uh, any final thoughts there, Bill? And uh, we'll, before we sign off. No, just that I want to have everybody have a very prosperous week, as we always uh, say at the end of each show, and, and uh, to emphasize that uh, we're here at your disposal. We, we do these shows. Uh, some of them uh, are a little spicier than others, but, uh, but our objective is to give you free advice. Uh, obviously, we can't give you specific advice or establish some sort of a uh, client relationship because we don't know your particular situation, but we want to give you generality so you can at least feed off of that and be able to act accordingly. And then if you do need us, uh, give us a call so we can, uh, we can get a little more specific with you. So with that, I'll uh, uh, sign off until next Tuesday, Rick, wish everybody a great week and uh, thanks for your participation. And uh, we'll see you next Tuesday. Awesome. Thanks again, Bill. We'll see everyone again next week at uh, 10 a.m. on Tuesday here on the Bottle Business Sense Show. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye, everybody.